Welcome to church. It's so good to see everyone here. We are going to get started by praising our God. So please stand and sing with us.
As you take a seat, let me pray. Father God, we thank you that you are all we need. We thank you that you sent your son for us to forgive us. Lord, and we just pray that today that we can just put everything aside so that we can praise and worship you and learn more about you through the word. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, everyone. Welcome to church. I found that really difficult, praise and worship, not because I don't love praise and worship, but I couldn't sing because I've been a bit sick through the week and I thought, I'm going to get up here and I'm going to end up coughing. So um, that was an interesting praise and worship time for me. So I hope that everyone else is feeling well. Um, And if not, I do pray that you don't get sick because it is not fun. Okay, so coming up in the life of church, um, we have um, a few things happening. 
As you can see, the renovations are still not finished. We were hoping they would be finished um, by this weekend, but with uh, our STEM club on Tuesday, Wednesday, and of course we also um, had Anzac Day. They were gonna come in on Friday and half paint, and then we would have had to move everything out and move everything back in. So we have left it to Monday. So next week, hopefully everything will be done, but it's looking great. And for those that weren't here last week, exit, uh, the entry to the toilets is a little bit further back now, not right here. Um, or you can also choose to go outside to the bathrooms as well through the glass doors. Uh, we have um, New to Life coming up next Sunday. Uh, after church at 12.15. Uh, this is a great time just to learn a little bit more about us. So if you are new or you feel newish or you would just like to learn a little bit more about Life Anglican Riverston, we would love you to come along. Um, and if you can uh, sign up for that, that would be great. Mm. It's at Miles and Morgan Stepniewski's place, which is the house on the property. 12.15, we'll head down and we'll have lunch together and just talk about a few things and you'll get to meet people as well. Uh, we have Alpha coming up uh, in May. We are really looking forward to that, a six-week session. Um, the, it's, a, it's a great time to um, just learn a little bit more about Jesus. So if you have questions or you know some people in your life that may have questions, uh, come along to Alpha. It's a great, great course. I missed one thing. So before we go to a video, I need to say, in a couple of weeks' time, we have Mother's Day coming up. Uh, so we are going to have a high tea at 10 a.m. Of course, high tea we can't have in here anymore because look at how many people are at church. Um, so we, but we are still going to have a high tea probably outside, uh, scones and jam. Bring along um, all those ladies in your life, mothers. Um, we'll have a great time. And then at 6 p.m. we will be having a dessert night. And now we're going to go back to Alpha because I do have something to say about Alpha. Um, as you know, on Tuesday we have a playtime. And... Uh, at playtime, we have a lot of people from our community come. And uh, this uh, next story that we're going to show you about Alpha is actually a story of a gentleman that came with his son called Junior, and uh, he found Jesus through coming to Alpha. Um, and so have a little listen to uh, Junior's story. If I can remember a song that was sung. With Jesus in the family, it's a happy, happy home. So I always wondered as a child, why my home wasn't happy? My parents are from Samoa. And so I grew up in a Samoan environment. Most Samoans uh, are religious people. And so, uh, growing up, um, you sort of always heard about God here and there. However, my home was broken. Growing up in a broken home, you have all these sorts of questions about God, about Jesus. So many questions, unanswered. Years later, I now find myself in Australia, uh, married uh, and with a child. I was looking for a place where uh, my child could hang out with other children. And so uh, we found this play group in Riverston. When my son and I arrived there, they were very welcoming, very warm. And that's where I crossed paths with Pastor Miles and Maria. We begun to get to know each other, which was very important to me. Uh, from there, uh, Pastor Miles invited me to a program they were running called Alpha. And as skeptical as I was at the time, I decided to go along to Alpha. At Alpha, uh, we watched videos of people's testimonies, their experiences with Jesus. I enjoyed the conversation with people. I enjoyed being transparent with people and people being transparent with me. I enjoyed the questioning. Uh, there was no question too simple to ask. 
there's a saying that God meets you where you are at. And I think in my life, there were moments of experiences where God met me, even though I wanted no part of God. Alpha was one of the places where God had met me, which has caused me to become a follower of Jesus Christ. Well, since Alpha, uh, I've been on a journey uh, to discover more about God. And so now I'm studying theology, discovering His purpose uh, for my life here on earth. And so I'm very grateful to Alpha uh, for helping me understand uh, the love of God. Every time I watch that video, it, uh, it actually emotionally affects me because, you know, that was a, that was a real journey for uh, Junior and it was someone that was um, actually in the, you know, part of something that we do here at Life Anglican Church. So that was great. And I love the way he said this is, was a, a time where I was able to meet Jesus. He met Jesus through Alpha. So if you have people in your life that don't know Jesus, please invite them along to Alpha because it could change their life or at least be the next step in their journey. Um, we are a church that loves to give. We love to give in how we volunteer and we love to give also in finances. And so we just have a short little AV. I'm hoping, there we go. Um, I'm going to pray. Um, and uh, as we reflect about how God has given us so much, um, more than we probably even desire or need, he gives us himself, which is incredible. So we're going to pray. We're going to thank God for that. Um, and please join me. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we have been singing about your grace, uh, your kindness to us this morning. Uh, like a big well that overflows. Uh, we just want to say thank you. We want to say thank you for your mercy as you give us the rising sun. Uh, thank you for saying that this gathering is precious to you. Um, and Lord, thank you so much for taking the sting out of death and our despair in this world. Um, we just want to say thank you. Uh, Father, we want to worship you because there is no one else like you. And you have shown us love, not that we loved you, but that you loved us and sent your son as proof. And as we see the story in your Bible, your spirit-breathed word, we see a world that's turned its back on you. And you drew near. You drew near to them and you draw near to us, just as you promised from the very beginning. And more than that, the Lord Jesus has erased the power of sin and blindness to a world who didn't even know they needed hope. Father, remind us of your saving work, of this grace that we speak so freely about, but probably don't plumb the depths of it. The reality of the Lord is that we just bring our sin and you joyfully offer us Jesus' righteousness, forgiveness and new life with you now and forever. It's an incredible deal. Thank you so much that you loved us more. Lord, as we open the Bible, uh, we read about how Jesus just sat and drew near to people. You moved them gently from knowledge about a vague God to worship, to challenging hearts and desires and gently calling people back to belief. Father, we pray would you do that today as we sit, as you sit with us in your word, Help us see the Lord Jesus and his heart afresh. And may that joy be like an overflowing well, satisfying our needs for today and tomorrow because we are known to him, the one who saves. Father, we pray, would you 
hold, help, help us hold fast to the Lord Jesus as we gently sit next to others and draw them near to you. Father, you tell us that this church is precious to you. Your body, you say it is. And you say, by faith, we are all children of God. We all have been invited to sit at your table of grace. And as your grace plums the, throughout all generations, help us be a people who seek each other out until you return. Please help us be a unified body, young and old and difficulties and brokenness. Lord, you've called us to be your people. And so, Father, would you stretch us to seek each other out at different ages and stages of life, enjoying the benefits of being your people, unified by the Lord Jesus. Father, we pray that your spirit might lead us in this to be a people who worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we have many needs. You know them. You perceive our thoughts from afar and you discern our hearts. Father, please lead us in the way of your, your ways, Lord. And we pray that, you're, that you might continue to build us up more and more to the likeness of Jesus. Father, we pray, would you have your way in this place? In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Divya. I'm going to read the Bible for us. So take out your Bible or your Bible app. Reading from John chapter 4, from verse 1 to verse 26, and then from verse 39 to 42. If you're new here today, you might have been given a Bible on your way in. If you don't already own a Bible, that's yours to keep and bring back with you next time you visit us. If you're new to reading with the Bible, you can head, us, head to the table of contents and find the Gospel of John. It's at the start of the New Testament. I'll give you a few more seconds to find the passage. John chapter 4, starting at verse 1. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon, a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time, because his disciples had gone to, into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with the Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you, and who you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. But, sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you are greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal <coughs> life. Please. Sir, the woman said, give me this water, then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands, and you aren't mar even married to the man you are living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim, where our ancestors worshipped? Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. 
the Father is looking for those who will worship him, worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Moving down to verse 39. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, He told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the saviour of the world. Thanks, Divya. Um, for the youth, this morning we have your uh, sheets of paper if you want to head back to the back there now. To Miles, he's handing them out. The plan uh, has changed a bit this week for our, our sermon. Uh, we originally had a guest preacher lined up to, um, to preach today. And uh, that, through a number of things and some ill health, the, change, the plan has changed a couple of times. So uh, I made the call yesterday morning that I was preaching this morning. Um, I, don't, I don't start my sermons on a Saturday, not since that disaster sermon back in January. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I don't start my sermons on Saturday, but um, what we're going to do this morning is... Um, we're going to do a little bit of bridging between two sermon series. Last week, we finished our series in John, got to the very end of John finally after a number of years. So, you know, back to John chapter 4, I thought we'd just start again and uh, go again. No, we're not going to do that uh, this year. Um, I wanna, we're going to jump into a series I was supposed to start next week called Living Reborn. I want to think a little bit about us as a church and what it looks like to be followers of Jesus, right? Receive new life in Jesus, not just as individuals, but as a community and what that looks like. And we're going to spend um, five weeks. We were going to spend five weeks. It's now six weeks. We're going to spend six weeks thinking about that. And uh, we finished last week, finishing John, the commissioning of Peter, where Jesus tells him, "You're on this rock, I'm going to build my church. You are... The church, you're, you're going to establish this kind of earthly structure as a church. And I really felt, as we talked about that, that there's a lot more that could be said about that, thinking about what that looks like. And now we're going to go into a series talking about what it looks like to be the, the born-again people of God as his church. And so I thought it's helpful for us to spend a little bit of time thinking more about what that means. Um, the truth is, when we think about what church is, what people think of church... There's a whole range of thoughts people have, uh, and we know in the kind of world we live, there's a whole lot of kind of negative thoughts floating around about what is church. And when we say something like, last week, I said the church is a gift from God, it feels like it often doesn't feel like a gift, or, or how can we say it's a gift when we see so much brokenness? Um, people, I mean, people will say this about religions generally, lots of things about religions, like it starts, religion is the main cause for wars, if we didn't have religion, we wouldn't have wars, or uh, religion has nothing good to offer. Um, and then there's a bigger picture of thinking about what, what it really means to be the church and what we mean by that. So we're going to spend a bit of time. I think this passage in John 4 helps us unpack kind of the heart of what Jesus has when he talks about his people as the church. And so we're going to think a little bit about that. Let me start with um, what I think is some really helpful misconceptions we have generally about religion, about church. Like one of the misconceptions we have is people talk about religion is the cause for all wars. Oh, we've talked about this before. Um, the reality is that's not what kind of things really look like. Uh, religion, uh, you know, historically, every culture in the world has had different kind of religious connections, and those are so intertwined with culture. So it's almost impossible to strip away anything from religion entirely. 
But uh, there was two guys who wrote the Encyclopedia of Wars. It's a, it's a three-volume encyclopedia. They examined over 1,700 wars that have happened through history. And as they categorised what the true reason for those wars was, uh, they really analysed only about 7% of those 1,700 wars. Really could be say they were religiously motivated. Um, the main reason for wars is nationalism, is people extending their territory over others. Another significant reason for wars actually isn't religious motivated, but motivated by people trying to get rid of religion. So it's the very people that might accuse religion of being something that's poisonous and unhelpful. It's that very idea that has driven a whole lot of wars. So we get misconceptions like that. We get other misconceptions, I think, like people say, religion has nothing good to offer. Uh, the late Christopher Hitchens wrote the book, God is Not Great. The subtitle was, How Religion Poisons Everything. And it feels like when we go into that space, we're suffering from a pretty short-term memory over the good that religion generally has caused. And, and specifically when we think about Christianity, the good that followers of Jesus have um, done in this world. I was talking to um, a missionary from Dubai who was saying in Dubai, the princes of Dubai uh, have a, a fair bit of um, grace towards Christianity because in their words, Christianity was there offering care for people before oil was discovered. So before there was money to be made, Christians were already there offering health care. So there's been uh, vastly, I mean, certainly in, in the West, our health care system is built through churches, uh, but that's impacted global. Welfare systems have been built through churches. In Australia, uh, in, in the West, education was built through churches. Even in New South Wales to this day, the reason we have the debate over scripture in schools is because churches started the schools, and when they handed the schools to the government... They said, with the one proviso, we still want to be the source of education for religion, for Christianity. We don't want to pass that over. We'll keep that responsibility. And we still kind of have that battle over, oh, why do churches get to go in schools? Well, one of the reasons is churches started the schools in the first place. Our education system comes from history and Christianity. Our justice system uh, in the West is uh, even up until 2005... Courts in America still had the Ten Commandments. There was a big push in 2005 to remove them from the walls of courthouses. But the Ten Commandments were there. So I think to say Christianity has nothing good to offer certainly is a, a swinging the pendulum a long way back the other way and suffering from uh, significant short-term memory. But I think we want to drive even deeper than just kind of a defense of the good or bad that has been done in the name of Jesus. We want to drive right down to the heart of what it means to be the church and what uh, Jesus means by the church. And we get that in this story where we think about what the, the heart of the issue really is. This story of the Samaritan woman, it's a great story of, of Jesus kind of interweaving um, some cultural history that's happening between Jews and Samaritans, uh, some needs and wants that's happening in this woman's life. And really, he weaves the thread right through to the heart of the issue. It seems like what's happening for this woman is that she uh, has been pursuing a whole lot of relationships in her life in order to bring herself satisfaction. And Jesus wants to narrow right in on that. So, so we get this story where he starts broad and he just says to her, give me a drink. Would you give me a drink? And she says, for cultural reasons, you're a Jew. You can't ask me for a drink. And then he says, to her surprise, you're right. I can't ask you for a drink because you should have asked me for a drink. To which she observes, well, you don't have a bucket and it's a well and that's not going to work. How are you going to get me a drink? And then Jesus pulls that thread tight down to this line, which we got in verse 13. Anyone who drinks this water, talking about the well will soon become thirsty again. But anyone who drinks the water I give will never be thirsty again. It will become a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Jesus pulls his thread tight, and what he wants to do is turn the picture of thirst 
on its head. He says, I have a water that will forever quench thirst. But first, let's talk about the other things that you've been thirsting after. And he starts going down that pathway of talking to her about these kind of um, cheap alternatives that she's been pursuing in relationships. Jesus knows her thirst. He knows with what, what she's been thirsting for in a human sense. And he knows what's really going to quench her thirst. And the same thing is true when we think about Jesus in our lives. Jesus knows our thirst. He knows the things that we're thirsting for. And the reality is we have an insatiable thirst. We have things that we thirst for. The, the classic is you see kind of in people's life. I mean, we talk about this with all kinds of things. Like you can never have enough money. The more money you have, the more money you seem to want. The more things you have... You shift your lifestyle where suddenly you want more things. Um, there's always kind of this bridge to the next thing. A classic example is um, just through people's, through people's life stages. The classic idea for a, a young adult, a young worker, is to feel like if I just find the right person in my life, I just need to find that right life partner, that right spouse, that right marriage if that just happens, that's the thing that I'm just lacking so much, deeply desiring, and I just want to see that answer. But we know, of course, that once someone's married, often we step into a space where there's a, a desire for kids, and if that doesn't happen straight away or at all or to the plans we have, there's suddenly this, if I just had that, that will be my answer. We go to another phase of life where we say, if I just had a better marriage or... In, or I, I just need security for my family. It's great I have a family. I, just, I wish I had the right job, the right security, the right house. Um, for those uh, in careers, there comes a point where it's like, if I just have that sense of achievement, I want the job that feels like I've done something with my life before I retire. If I just had that, I'd be happy. As people head into retirement, it's I just wish I had the right retirement plan. If I had the right retirement plan, things would be okay. And, and there's a great danger at that space to kind of get into this place of bitterness because many of those stages have passed and if they haven't worked out, then there's this bitterness about these things not working out. It, it's clear, and I think we all experience it in different ways. We know that, it, that experience that says, I felt like this was going to solve the issue. But when I got there... I realised, oh, there's actually some, there's another piece to that puzzle. That's what's happening in this woman's life. There's been all these relationships, a string of relationships. Jesus knows our thirst. In an earthly sense, it's an insatiable thirst. It'll never be satisfied. So Jesus says there is an answer. It's not having what your neighbour has. Having what your neighbour has will never satisfy because your neighbour isn't satisfied with what he has. Jesus is the only answer of what satisfies our thirst. He says, this was his words, you will never be thirsty again. That's tricky to think through what that means because if you are a follower of Jesus, you've had that experience that just following Jesus doesn't get rid of all those other wants. All those things still happen. There's still things in our lives we long for. So how can Jesus say, you'll never be thirsty again? I think there's two keys to this. The first one is, Jesus is uh, not talking about earthly desires. He's talking about heavenly, eternal desires. That's why he says, giving them eternal life. That's what this living water gives. That's the first key. Uh, and the second key is... Growing in worship of him. This is what he said. Verse 23. But a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such as these to worship him. The message here from Jesus is take your eyes off those earthly things and fix your eyes on him. Fix your eyes on eternal things. I've said this before, I think it's a helpful phrase for us to remember. Jesus didn't come to satisfy our desires. 
Jesus desires that we are satisfied in him. And seeking that satisfaction in him is an eternal satisfaction. And what that means, and what he's drawing a picture here, is it means we are growing as worshippers of him. Constantly pointing our eyes back to him. He uses that language, true worshippers. And that's ultimately what we would say we believe. That, that's what the church is. The church is the true worshippers, the ones that have fixed their eyes on him. When we talk about the language of the church, when the Bible talks about the language of the church, we use that language in a couple of different ways. It is, it's used in a, a local sense. Uh, the word church literally means gathering. So a gathering of believers is a church. But it's also used in a, we sometimes use the word universal sense, that everyone who is a follower of Jesus will one day be gathered around his throne. And that is the gathering, the global universal gathering, which is the church, the universal church. It's a timeless church, includes everyone through history that's a follower of Jesus. That is the church. And so sometimes we use the word Catholic to refer to that, not meaning the Roman Catholic church, but the word Catholic originally meant that universal, holistic church, everyone who is a follower of Jesus. So those two things are true in the, word, in the way we use the word church. Jesus wants to point us to the source of that, for both of those things. The source is him. He is the source. And it's worship of him. He says, in spirit and in truth. This is something that is inside out. It comes from him from, and working on the inside of us. As I was writing uh, this sermon, um, the kids were watching Madagascar 3 in the next room. Um, I don't know if you've seen Madagascar 3, but I don't know what the writers were smoking when they wrote that one. It's a lot of bright colours and uh, crazy music. Uh, there's a moment where Alex the Lion is trying to... Um, trying to inspire the circus performers about their circus, which is failing. And he comes up and points to one of the... He, he says to the circus performers, uh, this isn't the circus. And he comes up and points to the chest of one of the performers, performers and says, the circus is in there, pointing to one of the performers, Freddy, to his chest, which he looks inside his shirt. And another performer next to him goes, oh, why does Freddy get all the circus? There's a picture here that Jesus is saying that the, the church is actually something that comes from within. That's the, the language that's happening here. And he's working on us externally from the inside out. What that means is the focus is Jesus. The earthly church isn't perfect by any means, and it's a, a tragedy when people uh, do horrible things in the name of Jesus. The earthly church isn't perfect, but the point is we are fixing our eyes not on us, but on Jesus. Even as a local church, that is what we are doing. He is the source. He's the one that brings satisfaction. And the message is, come and drink deep from the well. He is the one. That is what we are as the church, both local and universal. And that is what we do, and that is our mission. Not just that we drink from the well, but that we invite others to drink also. We jump to that last little bit of um, John chapter 4, because I think it's, it's a helpful piece in the story, we get the story that sh this woman is transformed by her interaction with Jesus, and she goes off and she tells others, I've found the Messiah, I've found the one. And then they come. And that's a, a great reflection of kind of what we want our mission to be, but look specifically about what happens there in that interaction. Jesus says, uh, uh, sorry, it says in verse 42, then they said to the woman... Now we believe, not just because of what you told us, 
but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the saviour of the world. The message was not that they suddenly came and put their trust in the story of this woman. The message is that they themselves came and met Jesus. And one of the incredible things we believe as a church is that because Jesus rose again, because he is the living God, we too can meet him today. And we too can invite others not to put their trust in us, but to meet Jesus and put their trust in him. When we filmed that story of Junior, he talked about that idea. Um, he used the language, God meets us where we're at. Um, but uh, it was off camera when we were just discussing with him that language of meeting Jesus and how it can feel really, sound really strange, that idea, come and meet Jesus at Alpha, can sound strange. We know he's not going to walk in the door and shake our hands. It's not that kind of meeting. But it's important that we remember that that's what we're calling people to, to meet the living God. To not come and put their faith in what we believe and what we say, but come put their faith in him. It's one of the reasons why we open God's word every week. We, we seek to unpack it together, but really we want to keep going back to God's word and what it is he's teaching us. We want to meet God. What's important is that the church is all about Jesus. We are not perfect, but he is. Come drink deep from that well and invite others to do so. We're going to transition a little um, because we're going to go into a time of communion together as we reflect on uh, what it is Jesus has done, the one who satisfies when we put our when we, when we desire him, we want to reflect on that. But I think what's really important, throughout history, um, communion has been one of those, I think it's a helpful gift for us, but it's become a stumbling block because it feels like too often people take their eyes on going to Jesus as the source and they shift their eyes on other things. Communion is one of those things that at times in history, people particularly stop putting their trust in Jesus and start putting their trust in the local church. That is, people have the idea, as long as I get to church on Sunday and the minister gives me communion, then I will be okay with God. It's really important for us that that's not what's happening here. We don't do this as some sort of miraculous external thing that makes us right with God. Jesus is and always must be the source. It's one of the reasons why and we don't come up and kind of take communion from the minister up the front. Like the... Uh, thanks, guys. I know that if you've grown up in a church where uh, you might come up and take communion from the minister, that, that's, that's a meaningful thing for many people. And I know some uh, may miss that kind of interaction. It's really important to me that uh, it's clear that I'm not the one that's gifting some sort of blessing from God. But this is something that we gain directly from God. And as we take communion together, uh, we're doing something external, but what, it's a reminder of something internal. Jesus says, true worshippers worship in spirit and truth. And so we do this, uh, fo fixing our eyes on him. So what we're going to do now is uh, our team's going to pass out uh, some bread and juice. And if you're a follower of Jesus... Uh, doesn't matter if you're visiting from another church. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're welcome to join together in communion. Um, some of the younger people in church, you might want to check with your parents uh, or grandparents with you what the um, deal is. Uh, from our perspective, any follower of Jesus is welcome, um, but we want you to work that out in your own families, what you want to do there. We're going to have a moment, distribute the communion, and, um, and then we'll take it together. Hold on to it, and we'll take it together shortly.
Jesus said, those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. That is what we reflect on when we have communion together. That's what Jesus was talking about when he broke bread and he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body. Not saying this bread is now somehow miraculously my body. But this is a reminder of the inner spring of life that comes in our spirits through Jesus. And so as we eat and drink, we want to do that remembering what uh, Jesus has done for us and feed on him, uh, not in a physical way, but in a spiritual way by faith. So let's eat together remembering Christ's body broken for us and be thankful. And let's drink, remembering Christ's blood poured out and be thankful. As the band comes, let me pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are the living water. We know we put our desires into so many things uh, in this world. We pray, Lord, that we will fix our eyes on you. That we'll be reminded you, you are the one that truly satisfies. We pray that as we have eaten and drunk, we pray, Lord, that your spirit will be working in us, growing us by faith in you. We pray this in your name. Amen. God together and if you are unwell and can't sing or for any reason can't sing it's a horrible feeling but just know that you can worship God in your heart and I know it's not the same uh, but I encourage you to do that maybe that's by lifting your hands maybe that's by closing your eyes maybe that's just acknowledging with your heart that that Jesus is your Lord so I encourage you to worship our God in the best way for you to him let's sing together Yes, sir. 
Amen. As you take a seat, we just come to the conclusion of this service and we thank you for being here today and we hope that uh, you feel refreshed and ready to go out into our world. Um, and if you would love to stay and have some morning tea with us, that would be great. The coffee machine is going and we've got always have a great morning tea out there. So hang around and get to know each other and we'll see you again next week.